do you want to just get started? Yeah, yeah, okay. let's get started. Okay, thank you everyone, we're gonna get started. All right, well, uh, thanks everyone who's joining us here in Vid in person, and I see like 20 people who are joining us online on Zoom as well. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Jeremy Warner's dissertation talk as his advisor. So Jeremy joined Berkeley in 2016 after uh, degrees from the University of Rochester, where he worked with Philip Guo on studies and tools for CS students. So topic very relevant to research that's still going on in, in BID to this day. Um, today you'll see his research on visual communication tools, but he's been involved in a whole range of broader projects throughout his PhD. Um, notably, he led the work on ElectroTutor, a system for intelligent physical computing projects, and then worked with many other students here in the lab on tools for debugging electronics and embedded systems and other systems aimed at makers. Um, throughout his career, he's been a really great mentor to a number of undergraduate students. That's right here. So, uh, Tanya, Fred, Angela, uh, Xu Yao. Um, and some of them are now actually grad students right here at UC Berkeley or in other great careers. Um, as a TA, Jeremy covered user interface design as head TA. Um, he's also been a TA for software engineering and technology design foundations in a brand new MDES program. And there's an interesting kind of integration between research and teaching that I think you'll hear about today in the talk as well, where some of the tools that Jeremy built for research then got deployed in those very classes. Also want to mention that he's been a really outstanding citizen of the research group, the department, and the community as a whole. Um, Jeremy's been the repository of much knowledge around community and how things work in BID and has been kind of an advisor mentor to many of the younger students. And just want to point out, he's been uh, recognized multiple times as an outstanding conference paper reviewer as well. So um, a round of applause for Jeremy Warner and his distinct talk. Thank you. Thank you, Bjorn, for that uh, amazing introduction. Can you verify it's recording on the Zoom? Looks recording. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, sweet. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. Uh, we're gonna get started right away. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about enhancing visual media through reflection and composition. Let's see if this works. So a picture is worth a thousand words, um, and yet, AI-assisted visual media creation tools can create pictures from just a few words. And these will often have compelling results as well, like this uh, DLSR photo of a peacock on a surfboard. At least this is much better than I probably could have come up with on my own. Um, and this is actually just one of many output examples that can be generated from that same single text prompt. So it's actually like these words are almost worth more than one image. Um, and these, so these tools really have gained, uh, gained an immense amount of public attention, uh, has had broad impacts on artists, designers, and the general process of creating visual media, yet it's still kind of the Wild West in terms of what this space looks like and what the kind of correct way to approach creating media in, uh, with automation is. Um, and I'll kind of highlight this little quote down here, which says that it only took 20 seconds to make, which is obviously a bait for reading the article. Um, but if you actually look into the article, there's this really telling quote where they say, members of the team futz with the image in Dolly over the next 24 hours. Observing this process, I think this is sure a lot of human effort for a AI-generated magazine cover. So next, I'm gonna talk about some, some actual forms of media. So. Um, I've kind of covered this somewhat uh, maybe familiar at this point with people um, process for creating images from text, but there's also other cutting edge work in terms of creating vector graphics images and even slides from from text. So there's it's a kind of way of creating that is extending beyond just images. Um, and also these media have a relation to each other in terms of expressivity at least. So images really are kind of just pixels, color information on a grid. Um, 
Vector graphics can contain images, uh, but they can also encode geometric, textual, and positional data of the elements that are inside it. And then slide serves as a kind of ordered way of uh, sequencing vector graphics that usually aims to kind of construct some sort of narrative through the sequence. And in practice, uh, designers and artists take a much more nuanced uh, take to this process than the article's cover shows. So while image generation tools like Dolly aid in the rapid prototype creation, that media also needs to be evaluated. That is, somebody needs to gather and reflect on feedback in relation to whatever goal that it has. Additionally, these reflections and versions are used to refine future creations that uh, people, people make. And so while a lot of the focus and progress recently has centered around new uh, creation techniques, the other pieces of this cycle are just as important. And so my research has studied how to support this fuller process with the creation of uh, some new, new tools that I'll talk about. So firstly, uh, I'll talk about reflection and kind of revising slide-based presentations. And I'll also talk about tools for composing and mixing styles within vector graphics. As a higher level goal, I expand the focus on visual media creation to include iterative reflection and refinement. And in this talk, I aim to convince you that when we support this process, we ground the visual media more deeply in the real world and align with how people compose larger, more complex media. Um, and so as an outline of what I'll talk about today um, in this enhancing visual media through composition and reflection talk, um, I'll first go over a reflection, specifically how that works for slide-based presentations, um, some kind of composition and style mixing tools for vector graphics, talk about kind of a higher level vision, what does this all mean, maybe what's next, and then close with some acknowledgments because I definitely did not do this all by myself. So let's start with reflection. To start, again, this work was done with others here at UC Berkeley, along with UT Austin and Stanford. I want to start out uh, this section by pointing out one common thing that researchers do, which is prepare and give uh, presentations. So we frequently communicate our research and findings through the slide-backed talk format. And that's even true uh, right now, to start off on a bit of a meta note for what I'm doing. But even outside of research, talks occur commonly in fields across uh, education, government, business, and more. So it's all to say that really presentations are an essential form of communication. And uh, many, many popular slide creation tools exist, like PowerPoint, Google Slides, and Keynote. You've probably seen all of these. But uh, these really aren't enough when it actually comes to kind of creating um, refined, compelling narratives. So as a kind of an analogy, consider paint and brushes may enable painting, but so much more goes into the process of creating something compelling that people can relate to. Uh, similarly, word processors facilitate writing, at least compared to a typewriter or um, you know, stone tablets, but so much more actually goes into, for example, creating a high quality research paper, right? There's, there's a lot of skill and iteration in this process. And the same is true for slides. Um, just using Apple Keynote does not mean you automatically become Steve Jobs. <clears throat> so let's look to experts to see how they prepare for presentations. Um, we interviewed 14 researchers about how they prepared to give talks. And uh, one thing we found is that most work through an iterative refinement process. Uh, they practice giving the talk with their peers, and they complained about the messiness of feedback sources, which possibly other presenters here may have also encountered. Um, and one other thing that really came true from this is that, or came out of this, is that when it comes to giving a good talk, practice makes perfect. Experts practice by presenting uh, their talk and gathering feedback, discussing and clarifying it with their peers, reviewing that feedback, and then finally refining their presentation based on this. 
However, um, in this process, you generally collect an abundant set of feedback. And monitoring and organizing this all can be challenging as it comes from a range of sources, different people, you forget who said what, you don't take as many notes as you would have liked, you split your attention between giving a presentation and jotting down notes or answering questions. It'd be helpful if there was a tool or system that could support you through this important process. Uh, and that's essentially what we made, a tool called SlideSpecs. Um, SlideSpecs records and organizes written and verbal comments across the entire process of refining a presentation. The goal here is to support presenters and audiences with uh, better context and organization for this, this workflow. SlideSpecs also fits nicely into existing preparation processes with the addition of a facilitator role to help specifically during the discussion phase. Um, also, kind of, I guess, as, as Bjorn alluded to, this has also been used in um, two classes here at UC Berkeley, uh, User Interface Design and Development and Technology Design Foundations. Um, we've also used it in different research groups uh, and had a lot of engagement and you know, battle tested for the system. So it's pretty cool to, to see that come out of a research project. Um, and really the, the, the focus here is to automatically collect and organize audience feedback for the goal of refining their presentations. So as kind of a example, let's take my preparation for um, this talk as an example. So first I upload my slides uh, as PDF to SlideSpecs. And next, while I present, um, the audience provides comments on my talks. So this op uh, essentially they can write feedback to me about what I'm presenting, um, specific slides, specific tags or themes. They can reply, agree to other comments, or mark other comments for discussion later. And this is a shared interface, so <clears throat> the entire audience sees the same set of slides and comments, unless they choose to only see their own. After, after I give my talk, I will discuss my feedback with my, my audience. So we can see the comments that they marked for discussion and the audience can review others' comments that they'd like to discuss in the interface directly as well. Meanwhile, a pre-designated facilitator that I mentioned before records the discussion audio and marks comments as they're discussed for the presenter's later review. So to do this, they can either search for existing comments or create new topics manually. Finally, a revision interface lets me see the discussion transcript, topics that came up in conversation, all written comments, my slides, and all the connection between these things. I can then use this feedback to improve my presentation and uh, repeat the cycle for uh, future iterations. Um, next, I'll dive into two technical aspects of the, the system. So first, uh, automatic slide detection and facilitator transcription. So slide numbers provide relevant context for feedback, but manually assigning them can be tedious. Slides, slide specs can automatically detect the actively presented slide from, from your screen. So this way, if audience members like, they can simply associate their comments with the actively presented slide by default. To get this, we first compute color histograms and extract text segments uh, from each presentation slide image. This serves as a set of templates for us to match against later. The presenter screen then runs a process once a second to take a screenshot and generate relevant matching data. We compare the screenshot data against the input slides to look for a match, and then stream the matched slide back to the server, which in turn updates each client UI. Our matching algorithm leverages the fact that there's a order to the slides. Um, however, very dynamic media like videos may cause us to fail as uh, these kind of approaches aren't really as static there. 
This code is also available online on GitHub if you want to look at it. Or Next, I'll talk about the transcription pipeline, um, which essentially we record live audio with a single group microphone in the shared discussion area. We stream and save that discussion into our server and then pipe that to Google Cloud's speech to text API, which returns timestamps for each token. This helps create a chain of context across media. So in addition to the transcription, the facilitator marks relevant topics during the discussion and slide specs or audience members can ascribe relevant slides to their comments. So you can kind of see the different ways that uh, feedback gets connected across domains here. Now we wanna know what we've built actually works, right? So uh, to evaluate our system, we deployed slide specs in eight practice talks where each presenter used slide specs through one revision of, of their talk, including a presentation, discussion, and revision. We also interviewed each presenter after they had used slide specs to revise their talk in kind of one full cycle and sent surveys to each audience member. Each talk had on average nine contributing members, meaning anyone who had entered feedback. Um, and I'll next kind of discuss these findings in a little bit more detail. So audience really enriched their feedback with context, with 70% of comments actually having slide references. This is partially due to our ability to generate these automatically as other forms were used less often. Um, they also adapted different group practices to use slide specs successfully uh, providing authors with broad range of feedbacks across uh, a range of topics in terms of uh, talk content. We found that this feedback collation and contextual adjacent was very valuable for presenters. And presenters reported the overall shared group awareness helped refine their feedback, meaning it overall made it more coherent, it helped higher level themes emerge, and they found that it reduced the redundancy in their comments as well. Um, I'll, I'll leave this caveat though that context alone really is not enough, right? It doesn't necessitate um, or automatically give you valuable feedback uh, and there's no replacement for domain expertise. And really group trust and dynamic, dynamics still matter a lot in terms of uh, working with a group in terms of material that isn't fully finished. Um, I'll also talk about the facilitator role that I mentioned. So this person marks relevant discussion comments uh, for the presenter's later convenience, and this is very challenging. So one reason is that it's hard to pick what the top comment is anytime, and the other is that uh, when a comment is starting or ending, you kind of have to, you wanna mark that accurately, but you can't really do it preemptively, right? So this makes marking boundaries uh, accurately much harder. So, uh, I will recap this project. I've presented slide specs, a system for automatically and interactively collating presentation feedback. It supports presenters and audiences over their entire talk preparation cycle with valuable context and organization. And in general, for creative and iterative processes, assessing feedback and context is, is very uh, important. This, again, this is joint work with my collaborative collaborators here at Berkeley, um, Austin, and Stanford. And more project details and a demo can be found on my website. So some of this research has studied how to make this fuller process that I talked about with, uh, with uh, reflection. And next, I will also explore composing and mixing media to refine it in the domain of vector graphics. So here, um, I'll first kind of give an introduction to vector graphics. So vector graphics are essentially the de facto format that designers use for graphic design, and they have a dense scalable representation, which I'll talk about a little bit more. They can also contain rasterized images, so um, that's a common pattern in terms of UI mockups. Um, compared to other representations, they're not quite as specific and rigid as HTML is, or HTML and CSS but they're not as abstract as a pixel, which will contain some RGB value. And basically vector graphics can also include information around uh, geometric paths, gradients, um, 
different element groupings that help render it more efficiently. Um, another nice thing about this format is the scalable representation. So these shapes are generally encoded geometrically. They can be rendered sharply at arbitrary resolutions while still being compact. So if I take this uh, comparison of these two graphics, if I zoom in on the raster, I start to see some kind of sharp edges on the U, and if I even zoom in more, then it's pretty clear that you probably wouldn't want to blow this up to a billboard size. Also, as a form, uh, vector graphics are really used beyond user interfaces, including um, data visualizations, uh, fabrication processes like laser cutting, um, and encoding uh, PCB trace milling layouts. So they're, they're used pretty broadly. Um, and while designers are attracted to their flexibility, vector graphics still do have some weaknesses. And this is especially true when working with larger collections of documents. Designers source inspiration from the real world and real life examples. These examples serve as a basis or vocabulary to explore visual themes and ideas. However, incorporating the thematic elements of that design is often a manual and very subjective process. Um, another usage uh, case here is updating a set of designs to adhere to a single style. Um, effective visual communication really reuses visual metaphors and styles as kind of leveraging recall. Um, and so, for example, if you're restyling this design, you might apply the styles to it in this way. And this is often a subjective um, information that involves manually class labeling things and is ad hoc. Uh, also, if you, while doing this manually for one might be fine, if you had to scale this to a bunch of designs, this would be a very tedious process. And really kind of, this is hard for some other reasons too. Um, one is that often there's arbitrary element grouping. So rules that, or techniques that might work well for HTML that has more rigid structure uh, don't always apply here. Um, there's also implicit styles directly on elements often rather than having high level class uh, or document level style rules. And even for elements that are kind of corresponding across designs, what properties or attributes do you want to transfer? Um, this is related to kind of the concept of content versus structure in, in transferring styles. It depends on uh, what these are for the, for the context. Um, so to kind of support this process, I'll walk through uh, a demo of VST, our system for transferring styles across vector graphics. So designers import both a style source design and a target design to modify. We only consider, um, also in styling, we only consider inherent element style attributes and try to, don't try to match the sources of layout. Here are some results of transferring visual styles across vector graphics. To enable style transfer, we want some correspondence between the sets of elements that describes how the elements relate to each other. To do this, we use a uh, technique that involves a uh, graph walk kernel, which I'll talk about in a minute, to essentially create a mapping from the target set of elements onto the source elements. And again, many target elements can be mapped onto a single source element. This is kind of how this process works. Um, we also came up with some design guidelines when trying to work with vector graphics. So first, we really want to enable high-level tuning of cross-design element correspondences, because if you don't have this, you're kind of just editing things at a manual level, and you should probably just be using a standard vector graphics editing tool. Um, we want to enable flexible control over which style attributes are transferred. And we really want to reduce the time and work needed for actually transferring design styles. Um, the styling interface that we came up with contains four main components. First, the source design canvas, the target design canvas, the 
stylized target output canvas and a pane for styling, matching, and customization. Designers can preview this automatic styling result in the output uh, styling canvas and any visual mismatches will generally be very obvious using just, uh, just all principles. So what does applying styles actually look like? Um, initially, uh, it's as easy as just pressing copy all to Oh. I did not mean to go back. Um, initially, it's just as simple as pressing copy all. However, this uses the default output of the correspondence, which often needs to be refined to the designer's preference in, to get the correct style. So to fix correspondences, um, designers can select uh, kind of offending or outlier elements <clears throat> and then patch which element they should be basically styled after. To boost this process, uh, we given fixes can also be extended to other similar target examples. And multi-clicking elements works similar to how it would work in uh, text selection. The list of styles per element match can also be batch adjusted. So you can toggle to live preview variations of different style differences or customize values to things that aren't in either canvas as well. Um, and kind of to expand on that analogy a little bit, uh, in text, you, you probably know this, but if you select once, uh, you place a cursor. If you select twice, you select a word. If you do three times, you get the whole paragraph. Um, and we kind of use this analogy as inspiration for VST, where given we have information about how the elements relate on the canvas, we can find those elements and use that to enhance selection of uh, elements on our canvas. Um, so I kind of glossed over this before, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in depth about how VST works regarding correspondence. Um, and also just to clarify what a correspondence is, it means it's a connection between the elements that relate to each other across designs. First, why should we even consider the implicit structure of a design? So even outside of um, visual style transfer, which this kind of project focuses on, there's applications that of having good correspondences that are based on structure, like adaptive selection, which I've also featured, um, contextual search for similarity between designs, and uh, adaptive design layouts or template application tools. Um, next, I will talk about kind of how we make this correspondence. So we model designs as a graph. And to what I mean by this is we take each graphical element in our design, consider that a vertex, and then analyze the uh, heuristic layout and uh, design-related rules in relation to other elements on the canvas. So essentially, we take one design, we do this analysis, we get one output graph. Um, nodes are these graphic primitive edges, and then edges are relationships between them. Um, and if we want to compare elements or uh, you know entire graphs, we need some way to do that, right? And what we, how we do this is essentially comparing paths in the graph across designs. So um, if I'm considering these two elements and I want to see how similar they are, I can look at what paths are connected to them, um, compute a score across uh, after lining them up like this, and then uh, do some mathematical operations to get out some sort of similarity number that describes quantitative metric of how they relate to each other. Um, and kind of across the entire graph, what this looks like is uh, if I have these two designs that I want to compare as kind of like just a trivial example, um, I build some graph. Uh, I look at the walk that corresponds to or the path that corresponds to these two elements. But I would do this for every path that connects to it. Um, and then get a set of scores, which then I would generate this correspondence from, which I'm simplifying a little or a lot. But uh, the full algorithm and ablation data are in our paper. 
Um, this was work that uh, happened at Adobe with my collaborators Valentina, Bjorn, Celso, Holger, and Will. Um, and really the high level, uh, one of the high level takeaways here is the graph structure from implicit design structures can boost the accuracy of design correspondences. Okay, so back to actually styling vector graphics uh, with other vector graphics. So in our uh, evaluation of vector style transfer, we tried to answer three questions. So one, how would experienced designers use VST to stylize basic designs? Could VST adapt to styling more realistic or open-ended designs? And can VST actually reduce the time or work required for style transfer? Um, to analyze this, we experienced, recruited uh, six experienced designers to transfer styles using VST. After a short demo, they worked through styling eight total pairs of designs across two tasks. So, um, the first of the Five of these pairs were provided were, uh, by us, and then three of them actually used a source that they provided beforehand. So participants created a design from a provided prompt before the study began, and they used this to stylize three unseen but related designs. Uh, and these are kind of the results that they brought in to the study, created with a vector graphics tool before even starting a study. Um, and then kind of as a kind of zooming in a little bit more for what this looks like, they would take this source design, we would give them a target template, and then they would transform it using our tool based on the styles that they originally encoded in their previous vector graphics. So we ran this evaluation with uh, six designers. They got a brief introduction and tutorial at the beginning, and each participant worked through all eight style transfer tasks. Um, we also ran a follow-up study to measure VST's relative performance um, regarding editing styles with traditional tools. And so we recruited six, uh, four uh, replication designers with professional experience to recreate a design subset from the original study. And we measured time, number of selections, uh, and edits made. Um, there's two conditions we also analyze. The first is a basic condition, which essentially we give them what we gave the original designers. We say, all right, here's these two designs, um, essentially make the, the provided output. And to be fair, we also gave them the automatic uh, output of applying VST without any adjustments made. So we just kind of run the algorithm, um, download that, and see if there's a difference between editing these two towards the target goal. And also just to clarify, the source style and target structure were given as vector graphics, and then the replication goal was just given as a target image, a raster image. Um, we also recreated the same set of designs using VST as a baseline. So, excuse me, given the source, uh, you wanna create this goal, but the, the, we varied how you start, right? So the first case, you're just starting from the blank empty template. Um, same thing that the original participants started with. And in the second case, you're starting with the automatically generated uh, vector style transfer results. And Kind of some results of this study. Uh, so, pretty pretty simply, uh, given the source and target designs, participants were asked to make these as visually similar as possible. Right. So, just apply the source styles onto this. It's kind of a subjective task. Just basically told them to do it until you're satisfied with it. Um, so we've given these two things, and they say, okay, make this new stylized output graphics. Um, so participants used our styling interface VST to transfer styles across a breadth of designs in the same way. So they're given on the two designs on the left, and then per participant, each column shows different designs that they created. 
Um, and it's no worth noting that even though many transfer results were homogenous across the design, more complex designs yielded higher variance in the end output, kind of showcasing some of the subjectivity that it comes when uh, deciding what relates to what. Participants also use the interface to create consistent visual styles on a range of target designs that matched their created source design. So we provided these three target templates and asked them to transfer styles. They brought in these existing graphics beforehand, and then they generated the stylized output in the center grid, kind of as a cross section. So if you look in each row, you can see, oh yes, this is clearly a modified version of this target template. Uh, if you look in each column, there's a visual style that said, oh yes, this is clearly from this participant's original design. Um, so after the uh, study participants also filled out a brief study or survey after using the tool um, and highlights from the written feedback include finding it to be fun and magical time saving and unlike other tools that they had used before uh, we also find that VST can significantly reduce the time and work that uh, ex compared to an experienced designer using industry standard design tools uh, yes, and similar levels of satisfaction as well. So this is just kind of showcasing some of the results from our replication study. Um, blue and red are the two cases where the starting point varies. So blue is you're just starting from the raw template. Red is you're starting from the uh, modified, basically automatically styled template. And then green is using VST. So uh, essentially, we vastly outperform um, these other, other uh, methods for transferring styles. Um, but one interesting thing that I want to talk about is also how we would kind of expect the auto condition to be easier, right? If you're applying styles uh, that presumably bring you t closer to some goal, you would expect that you have to make less edits beforehand. But we essentially, while not significant, basically found the obvious. Um, so some of the kind of intuition here is that a partially correct transformation can actually reduce the cohesion for future, future manual editing. Um, so yeah, ultimately it's not significant, but it suggests how the current landscape of design tools aren't quite prepared to take advantage of more advanced mechanisms for editing designs while allowing the designer to retain control over the end product. Um, I'll, I'll kind of talk about two key enablers here. So uh, the first was really tuning generated design correspondences. So letting de designers say, OK, what actually relates to what across designs? Um, and also tuning what each correspondence does, right? Like it's not enough to say what's related, but how should things change based on this relation between designs? Um, also, as a fun fact, we even use VST to refine figures within our paper by trans transferring styles uh, across our paper figures, which is fun. Um, so more project details and a demo can be found on my website. This is currently under uh, submission to uh, WIST 2023. Um, so this research has studied how to support this fuller process with refining media as well. Um, and yeah, so I'll kind of wrap up with some vision and acknowledgments. Um, so really the, the kind of key things that I think I've learned in my work is that it's really important to incorporate more context and flexible control into media composition and refinement. Um, some things that this might look uh, for, for next steps. So this is something we're actually actively working on right now. It's not really like less of a future work and more of a current work, but um, uh, transferring layout or other group-based properties that aren't essentially just one-to-one, -one, but refer to how multiple elements relate to each other. This enables layout and shape transform. Um, so VST it enables this atomic element property transforms, but we really want to do more complex things. So there's some kind of constraint satisfaction um, and layout paper here. So this is uh, also getting ready to be submitted. Um, another, I, I think, kind of cool idea here is 
re refining what the correspondences are in terms of how to make them more robust or flexible. Uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of existing vector graphics that I feel like might um, be able to be leveraged for learning a broader representation for what uh, both how vector graphics relate to each other and how individual elements kind of um, form some sort of implicit classes across designs. Um, another idea is to kind of remove this source and target framing and instead um, fuse elements and styles into a new graphic by taking natural text instructions for what to transfer um, or change across a design. Um, also, this is something that uh, I'm not doing, but I'm very excited about uh, Pei Tong's project for design linting. So can we um, evaluate designs with heuristic guidelines? So if we have some text-based guidelines and a source design, can you essentially get some automatic reflection on how that design is performing in relation to what your goal is? Uh, I'm jumping over to slides a little bit from, from vector graphics. Um, there's also a lot of interesting, I think, next steps here. So for one, for finding context, a lot of the work for the facilitator involves finding things that are relevant uh, across this stream of media, which is very hard. And I think it's a place where LLMs or other um, kind of automation and summarization tools would really stand to benefit presenters a lot. Uh, the same is true for slide relevance. So finding, if you have, if you're writing a specific comment, obviously the currently presented slide is a good guess, but there's there's more to it than that. Um, and lastly, like, or not lastly, but uh, distilling feedback. So if you want to distill the feedback you've gotten even further um, for some abstractive summarization into a, a to-do list rather than just, you know, reading all the comments, that's, I think, another natural next step. Um, maybe a little bit more out there or generating new feedback. So. If you have all these presentation materials that you've developed, um, can you essentially generate feedback based on what your goals are for the talk without a live audience? Um, and then another kind of idea on this vein, so automatically modifying presentations or um, leveraging the feedback to close the cycle and essentially refine your presentation from this feedback, I think is also exciting. Um, perhaps even using the source PDF. Uh, so one last slide on kind of like future vision. So looking even broader, I think there's other ways that we can kind of uh, look to the future. So one is vision-based understanding for um, user interfaces and designs. There's a lot of uh, kind of interesting first steps in this direction, but I feel like there's way further that this can go. Um, other instruction-based editing and transfer for other medias like 3D scenes or assets to enable semantic attribute transfer in those domains. Um, bridging the gap between images and vectors by more robust image vectorization. And leveraging this working history where people are going through this cycle and they're generating a lot of contextual data about what their goals might be that maybe is clearer in that process than just by editing a single text command. So maybe there's some way to um, leverage that. Okay, um, great. So I, uh, I'll close with some acknowledgements. Um, to start, I want to thank all of my uh, research collaborators and supporters who have given me advice and helped me along this widespread journey. So um, all of the paper authors that I worked with, Wendy, with Philip when I was starting, and uh, with Bjorn. These are people that I've just co-authored papers with. I've definitely been helped by countless others who are in the room or on the Zoom call. So I'm truly grateful for you for, for uh, all the support you've given me. Um, I also want to spend uh, special thanks to my internship collaborators across Adobe, uh, Valentina, Will, um, Apple, Gabriel, Amy, Jeff, uh, and Autodesk, Ben, and, and Toby. Uh, your guidance and welcoming support greatly aided my PhD career, which I'm, I'm grateful for. Um, next, I'll get a little bit nostalgic and go back in time before I got started in research, back when I was a electrical and computing engineer sophomore at the University of Rochester. Um, this is from the river. I was on the rowing team, and one of the highlights was uh, the campus is adjacent to a river, so you get to kind of just watch the sunrise. Um, uh, Wendy Heinzelman uh, posted a research posting to the ECE undergrad list looking for a research assistant and brought me into her lab, allowed me to contribute, um, including an NSF REU summer 
internship, which kind of opened my eyes to different research opportunities. I just wasn't even aware of this possibility. Um, so yeah, incredible, thank you. And uh, this is furthered by Philip Guo, who's only at Rochester for two short but uh, very important years for me before he'd both escape back to California, or at least back for him. Um, and his guidance and support through my fifth year master's was very influential to my research career, and I'm really grateful. Um, okay, so fast forward a little bit, coming to Berkeley, um, I've also found a inspiring and uh, vibrant community of researchers here. I feel so lucky to have been able to do my uh, graduate degree here. Um, this is a actual snapshot from the lab space in 2017. Uh, and of the people in that lab, there's only two left, so you know, We'll see, who, we'll see who can uh, remain around the longest. No, um, I think you might have me that, Bryn. But uh, myself and my good friend and former housemate, Daniel Lim. Um, but that doesn't mean you know, we're just alone. There's other new students who have joined our research group and made it you know, just as vibrant as it was before. So I'm super grateful to everyone here who made those paper deadline pushes more manageable and ultimately made the journey of doing a PhD that much more enjoyable. Um, also, outside of Bjorn's group, I'm grateful for all of COSA's students who we basically co-share the, the space with. Um, and I've pictured a bunch of other PhD students who are not in this group photo that have been just supportive to me. Uh, maybe we haven't co-authored papers, but I, I feel like I've definitely benefited from the community that we, we have here at Berkeley. Um, there's definitely too many people and I, I've, I've gotten help and inspiration from others who are, who are not here too, so I apologize if I've, I've missed you. But yeah, I just wanna be grateful. Um, also, I wanna thank these uh, excellent undergrad and master students that I've gotten to work with while here at Berkeley. So I think one of the highest forms of knowing something is being able to teach it to someone else and I benefited greatly from working with, with all of you. So Shuyo, Angela, Frederick, and Tanya. Um, I'd also like to send an explicit thank you to my dissertation committee. Um, generally, your advice was incredibly useful in focusing my work and creating a higher level vision for it. So thanks to my advisor Bjorn, um, Professor Marty Hurst, who actually even used slide specs for one of her talks, um, Professor Efros for inspiring me with his fantastic computer vision and computational photography courses, and Valentina Shin, my previous mentor from Adobe who led the Graph Kernel Vector Graphics Correspondence Project and also worked with me after my summer internship had ended. My journey here was certainly shaped by all of you, and I appreciate your role and support in my career. Um, I also want to spend a bit more time on my advisor Bjorn. So this is us teaching CS160 together in the fall of March 2020, by the way. Um, good times. <laughs> uh, and there's also this legend from my PhD uh, advisor's first student who graduated before my time in 2016. Um, she had shaved her head at the beginning of the PhD only to grow it out over her, uh, disserta or her, the length of her degree. And at her defense, she actually cut it off with a katana and gave it to him as a parting gift. So seriously, you can, you can uh, search Valkyrie Savage dissertation defense on YouTube and it should come up. Worth a watch. Um, I did consider this uh, after uh, growing up my hair in quarantine, <laughs> but Bjorn made me promise that there would be no swords at this defense. So um, instead, I have actually brought something different. Uh, Bjorn was also a DJ in Europe, so I feel like I'll have a little bit of a music appreciation. I've stashed my guitar here. I'm gonna play a short serenade that I've written. <laughs> um, this just should be just about like 90 seconds to two minutes. Hopefully this is on tune.
but yeah, this isn't a concert, so I'll actually wrap up. Uh, <laughs> um, another note on my advisor, uh, sorry to just keep you a bit more time, is that most, probably most of his graduate students um, and anyone who visited his website is familiar with this iconic um, triple Venn diagram of his research projects. And there's two fun facts that I want to uh, point out about this diagram that I really love. Um, the first is this floating section of work that is actually not connected to any part of the diagram. So shout out to Amy Pavel. Um, and the next is that I pulled this graphic from your website last week, and none of the papers we've authored over my time here at Berkeley have yet to appear on it. Uh, in fact, it froze around 2016, and the latest paper I could find is CHI 2016, which is actually my first time attending CHI. So that's, that's just kind of a fun, <laughs> cool fact. But to be fair, I, I love my advisor. This is, this is roughly around the time of Jacob's opening and getting tenure, so I just want to say I understand. Um, <laughs> Um, and uh, to showcase that I really am my advisor's student and to appreciate the range of products that I've worked on, I made a small recreation as a nod to this diagram. So um, I've worked in uh, vector graphics composition, like what I've shared in this talk, uh, electronics debugging at the start of my PhD that Bjorn mentioned, um, smart woodworking collaboration with uh, Kevin Tan of Eric Paulus's group, um, talk feedback, slide specs, this is also in this talk, novice collaboration tools, um, for programming together, uh, wireless communication sensor design when I was getting started out in, uh, in, in research in undergrad, um, electronics assembly, programming tutorials, and uh, computing education. So this is a fun exercise because it showed me that I actually did touch most of the core uh, areas of the Venn diagram, although I'll say the modern version probably looks a little bit different than this one. And um, Bjorn, you've been a fantastic advisor. I can't thank you enough for the guidance and encouragement that you have given me over the years, so thank you. Um, and of course, there's more to life than research too. Um, thank you to my family. This is my uh, brothers and sisters for always cheering me on with their, their love and support. Um, thank you to my New York friends for staying connected and reminding me how to make time to relax and just enjoy being live, just countless jokes and, and laughs. Um, thanks to my bandmates for the past four or five years for providing me with a different creative outlet outside of research. Um, and thanks to my housemates for, at this point, almost, some of them almost like six years for really creating a warm and positive foundation for me when I moved out here to the West Coast. Um, and also one more photo page because I really do love and appreciate the people in my life, many of whom are watching today. It's been quite the journey. So this is my larger extended family, new version of the housemates, um, other New York friends, uh, other California friends, my a uh, good friend, Austin, from uh, UCLA, those of me visiting him down there, and Micah and Cody. So um, thank you, everyone. Um, and lastly, can't, can't, give out, uh, can't end without shouting out the two people I definitely wouldn't be here without my parents. So you, <laughs> you two have been an endless source of love, understanding, kindness, and support, even when your son, for some reason, uh, decided to do a 12-semester graduate degree at, while already having a master's degree 3,000 miles away from where you raised me. So you're, you're incredibly understanding and kind and role models for how to treat others. So, so thank you. Um, and uh, that, that's it. That's my talk. Thank you. Everybody. Now I think we can eat some uh, Shandong uh, restaurant food or take questions, I guess. I have a question. Sure, yeah. So, slide specs. Uh, who needs to see that talk more? Is it the team at PowerPoint and Google Slides, or is it Zoom and other like, conferencing companies? Yeah, it's a... It's, uh... It's a good question. So the, the question is like, where is slide specs most relevant? Like more towards slideware or more towards video conferencing? I'll say that um, basically the when we made this, it was uh, actually pre-pandemic. So visual video conferencing wasn't as the norm as it is now. Um, I think a lot of the transcription and tracking stuff simplifies when you don't have to deal with a group microphone. Um, so if anything, I'm, I'm guessing the Zoom is probably the place to say that, like, oh, if you're tracking this, let's make an integration into PowerPoint or Google Slides that kind of filters in that feedback directly there. Yeah, uh, let me open up the chat, I guess, see if there's questions there. Um,
slide spec ballas slide specs was not used to iterate this stack, but it was a, pre a previous talk actually. So I, I did lie a little bit when I said I use it for this talk. It was, it was for a different talk. Um, and I'd like to note that you know, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. So uh, that we are actually seeing increased integration of video conferencing softwares and um, PowerPoint presentations. Uh, the latest feature in Teams is that you can actually put PowerPoint into the um, video conferencing. And I feel that's where SlideSpec really bridges the gap, right? Mm. Um, because we are going away from this um, phase where we are sharing video textures of whatever we are doing to actually putting in the file. I think, I think it's called live share or SharePoint something. Anyways, so, uh, so I think, yeah, it would be super exciting to see something like SlideSpec bridge that gap. Cool. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's it makes a lot of sense. People have used it, have said it's good. So um, yeah, hopefully it can inspire that some work in that direction. Hi Bala. Hi Bala. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Also, my most favorite research project ever, and I'm not even like exaggerating. Like uh, the amount of uh, I praise. Um, like I need to mention this: is, we have used slide specs for so long. And for almost every Kai talk, Wish talk for quite quite some time, at least before the pandemic, and during the pandemic, oh, it was it was just amazing. So, so definitely kudos to SlideSpec. <laughs> Thank you, Bala. Appreciate it. it. Means a lot from you. Thank you. Um, we are after the hour, so I feel like I don't want to hold anyone or like keep them for for food. Um, so, shall we? Close and wrap it up. Another round of applause. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I see. I see your comments. Appreciate it uh, in the Zoom. Thank you for coming and watching. Um, hope this is fun. Okay. I'm gonna end the call.